And ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to appearing on any stage, I find myself always following someone else. By force of habit, I feel comfortable making my entrance a few steps behind the soloist. In this case, my wonderful young colleague, the soprano Harriet Burns, who will certainly prove to be the star of this evening's lecture. Apart from being true, that was modest, wasn't it? <laughs> but modesty comes more naturally in some professions than others. Do you remember those days when at a press conference in America, George W. Bush and Tony Blair would march two abreast, arriving at their lecterns and grinning simultaneously as if the powers of their two respective countries were equal? Well, those of us who play the piano for singers are usually less sure of ourselves. We make our entrance behind the evening's principal artist and then usually walk behind the piano, all too aware that as far as the audience is concerned, we are not the most important person on stage. <laughs> Obsequious, some would say. Not at all. Simply realistic. We begin the evening with one of the earliest songs by a great composer with an accompaniment written for this relatively modern instrument, the piano. Although in those days, its forerunner was known as a forte piano rather than a pianoforte. In 1794, Josef Haydn visited England for the first time. While living here, he composed a collection of songs to English poems, an admirable achievement for an Austrian already in his 60s. In one of these English canzonettas, the Mermaid Song, the singer swims beguilingly through musical waters while the shipwrecked pianist splashing around on the keyboard is lured to an uncertain destination. Here is an excerpt. Follow me, Haydn's mermaid commands, and follow the sailor does, just as it is my job to follow the singer. In reality, I don't follow her. My job is to be exactly with her, not behind her. Sitting at my keyboard and while still afloat, I have my own realm of influence. Our partnership is neither a shipwreck nor a power struggle, rather is it a pooling of resources between two people, one facing you, the audience, and the other whom you can see only working in profile. The glories of the human voice are usually the focus of everyone's interest, but this evening, the tables will be temporarily turned while we examine the pianist's viewpoint. The most famous singer's pianist of all time, Gerald Moore, wrote an autobiography with the revealing title, Am I Too Loud? You will notice that the lid of the piano open wide for a solo recital is only half open here. Moore also wrote a book with tips for members of his profession entitled The Unashamed Accompanist. There it is, that word. As you will have gathered by now, I am an accompanist, one of those unashamed beings who specialize in playing the piano for singers on the concert platform. Outside the sphere of classical music, to accompany someone means being a travel companion, going somewhere with a friend. When Her Majesty the Queen asked me what I did for a living, I answered, I accompany singers, ma'am. She seemed puzzled. Of course, I should have replied, I accompany singers on the piano. 
In the absence of clarification, our sovereign clearly took me for a baggage carrier or even a roadie. <laughs> she was very gracious, of course, but clearly wondered what on earth I was doing in that lineup. Perhaps I was simply very, very good at traveling with people. <laughs> she moved on before I could explain. And it was ever thus. My profession is similarly misunderstood throughout the world. In Germany, an accompanist is a begleiter, a word that also means rather embarrassingly, escort. In North America, my colleagues call themselves collaborative pianists. But for me, at least, collaborator has unfortunate echoes, as if I'd been a French pianist circa 1941 entertaining the Germans. When I accompany singers, I don't want to feel I'm collaborating with the enemy. And the term collaborative pianist is too clinical for me. It, it may be suitable for the tough equality and fearless give and take of chamber music, but it fails to encompass the intimacy, the, the ever watchful complicity of a pianist charged with looking after and nurturing a singing recitalist. A relationship that I maintain is unique in all music. Collaborative pianist was a term invented to make North American accompanists feel better about themselves while doing nothing to raise their fees or improve their standing. <laughs> I prefer not to be a living, playing euphemism. Accompanist is fine by me whether or not my American colleagues feel demeaned by the word. Going on a journey with someone is my definition of giving a recital with a singer, even if we also end up metaphorically speaking, carrying the singer's baggage. And let's face it, whatever word we use, our work remains a mystery. Here is a quote from a pioneering book on the subject by the American Algernon H. Linden in 1916. There is no branch of the art of music about which so little is known as the art of the accompanist. It's the only aspect of music which is not understood except by accompanists themselves and in a lesser degree by the artists they accompany. The idea of an accompanist as it exists mainly in the public mind is that he is a pianist who is not competent to play solos. If you wonder how that perception of incompetence came about, here is the accompaniment to a once famous Italian song, Il Bacio, The Kiss. <laughs> and then again. <laughs> well, that doesn't sound very much like a kiss to me. As you will hear, the whole thing sounds a little better with the addition of the voice. Well, even with the voice, that's not a great piece of music, is it? <laughs> but it was very popular, and in the Victorian era, it was compositions like this that made their composers a lot of money while giving the pianists in my profession a risible reputation. Before the First World War and the advent of jazz, there were pianos in every parlor. Dutiful daughters used to play accompaniments not very well for their mothers who sang also not very well. Wives played for singing husbands and vice versa. These well-meaning and compliant domestic ghosts have long haunted the reputation of the accompanist. In those days, musical support at the piano was somehow dispensed with the skill of an unctuous butler or a waiter changing the tablecloth without the diners even noticing. It might have been even better if the, if the assisting pianist had been H.G. Wells's The Invisible Man the hit novel of 1897. And yet now, as then, singers need an accompanist. That dispenser of accompaniments 
remains musically indispensable, a necessary co-evil. The nub of the matter is that the um pa pa banality of the Italian ditty we have just heard is completely unrepresentative of what we song accompanists are actually called upon to do in terms of pianism and musicality, skill and complexity, in terms of musicianship, imagination and initiative. Contrary to cliche, there is no such thing as a born accompanist or a born second fiddle in a string quartet any more than there is a born orthopedic surgeon. One must have the talent, of course, but it takes years of experience, years of doing it to achieve competence, let alone mastery. I always knew I was destined to be a pianist, but even as a child, the life of playing the piano alone on stage was not very appealing. It's very lonely being a solo pianist, practicing alone for hours. Accompanists, on the other hand, thrive on conversation during their working hours and they relish music associated with words. As a youngster and a long way away from London, I was ignorant of the highways and byways of music. I could dream, I could not dream of becoming something I knew nothing about. My piano lessons lifted me into another world and to inhabit that world permanently, I thought I would have to become a solo pianist. In any case, how many children dream of being a stoker rather than an engine driver, a caddy rather than a golfer, a cabinet secretary rather than prime minister? It takes a grown up of a particular kind to realize that playing second fiddle has a pleasure and power all of its own. It is also a grown up decision to become an accompanist, not because one has failed to become a soloist, but because one wants to do this thing, this other thing, completely different thing, entirely for its own sake. There were some hidden indications of my future. My schoolboy enthusiasm for languages and English literature unexpectedly turned out to be a boon for my chosen musical career. As a child, I had little idea that I would later encounter vocal music where an understanding of foreign languages was crucial. I certainly could not predict that I would come to love songs composed in German and French to the extent that they seemed part of my own heritage and that a daily engagement with the culture of these countries and countless visits would dissolve in my own mind all territorial borders. This did not mean, of course, that I was any the less enthused when great British composers set our own equally great English poetry to music. It was all part of the same great, big, wonderful thing. One composer who crosses all the borders of European song is Franz Schubert. Underestimated in Austria in the first half of the 19th century, it was a pair of his posthumous English admirers, George Grove and the famous composer Arthur Sullivan, who played an important part in instigating his worldwide fame. Here is one of Schubert's most famous songs or leader, Heidenröslein. <laughs> The fact that songs have to be performed in various keys is because all voices by their very nature have different ranges. The shifting of any key of a song to fit the individual singer is called transposition and it's one of the special skills required of an accompanist. What about this? So Rösein, Rösein, 
that song, Heidenröslein, is the work of Franz Schubert, composed in 1815. The accompaniment couldn't be more simple, but the folk-like melody above it is a work of genius. It's a bore to play Il Bacio, but it is a privilege to engage with this distilled simplicity. The text about an overconfident lad who learns his lesson by pricking his finger on a rose thorn is by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. I remember coming across that name in a book as a child and being utterly bewildered as how to pronounce it. <laughs> Go Eth, I decided. <laughs> At that time, I was unaware that one day he was to become a very important figure in my professional life. I envied those among my colleagues who'd been accompanists from their childhood, as had quite a few with musicians for parents. Imagine how different things would have been for me if, I, if I'd been raised in, in, say, Vienna, where every school child knows about Goethe and where children are taken to their first opera, Mozart's Magic Flute, at the age of six. Instead of becoming a song accompanist at the age of 21, I could have been working with singers at a much earlier age. Just imagine. Here I sit and practice every day. Mozart, Schubert, Haydn. By great writing, simply overjoyed. Good Schiller, Eichendorf, and Freud. Freud, yes. To have read a bit of Sigmund Freud if one works with singers for a living is a great help. <laughs> Sorry, Harriet. One could give an entirely separate lecture about our informal role as sometimes psychiatrist, confidant, and life counselor. And when recitals go wrong, the accompanist is an equally responsible partner in crime, an accomplice. The time to draw the line is when an admired and dependable colleague at the piano is expected to become a factotum. And the sad fact is that many pianists feel they must acquiesce in this role in order to keep their jobs. This is not to say we pianists do not owe singers a very great deal. Of course we do. And particularly when the younger accompanist is privileged to work with his elders. I do not forget my own debt of gratitude in my 20s to Victoria de Los Angeles, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, and her husband, Walter Legg, and two Peters, one English, one German, the tennis Peter Piers and Peter Schreier. These great artists took me up and helped to shape me as an accompanist. And as a result of hearing Benjamin Britten play Schubert songs as only he could, I had come to the composer's leader better late than never when I was 21. Schubert composed over 600 songs to 120 poets. He is the Shakespeare of accompanied song. There are, of course, many other great composers and literally thousands of songs with texts in many languages. The song repertoire is a vast multinational mosaic made up of small but uniquely individual pieces ranging between one and eight pages of music, occasionally longer, and sometimes arranged into groups or song cycles. A singer gets to learn his or her own repertoire, but we accompanists are required to know everything, everyone's repertoire, both male and female. Each of these tiny and intricate mosaic fragments is different from the other, and in getting to know them, there are no shortcuts. In a song recital, a careful assemblage of these potent miniatures can add up to something truly extraordinary. And it's often the accompanist's role and delight to plan the program for singers who are often too busy to do so themselves. When all four contributors, poet, composer, singer, and pianist, reach across the centuries to work together, the effect on the concert platform can be incandescent. In my early 20s, I collected all the LPs of song recitals I could manage to buy on a student budget. Recitalists like Eleanor Gerhardt, Elizabeth Schumann, Lottie Lehmann, the one and only Dietrich Fischer-Dieskau, the 20th century's greatest leader singer. 
these people became my daily bedsit companions. And that is to mention only some of the Germans. I was equally obsessed with recordings by French, British, Russian and American singers, as well as the vocal music from those countries. Of course, I also admired the great singers of Italian opera, Maria Callas, above all. Opera is the lavishly subsidized step of the much younger song repertoire, making songs something of an eternal Cinderella. After listening to hundreds of recordings by other people and after attending countless recitals, I began to ask myself what I as a pianist could bring to this repertoire. The answer lay, for me at least, an ever closer study of the composer's wishes and intentions, the faithful execution of what they had asked for in their scores. The more one knows about the composers, the better, of course. And it requires one to have faith that composers like Schubert knew exactly what they were doing and that they were, in fact, one step ahead, cleverer than us performers. My growing confidence that this was indeed the case meant that defending the integrity of the composer's intentions, at least as far as I could decipher them, became something of a mission. It seemed to me that we were the guardians of composers who were no longer able to stick up for themselves. Let's look at another Schubert setting of a Goethe poem, Der Musensohn, the son of the muses. When singers and pianists first discover the song, what a jolly romp it appears to be. With a wonderful tune and a rollicking accompaniment, it's often performed a bit like this. <laughs> wasn't it? <laughs> Awful. Mainly because I rushed ahead, having a jolly good time, paying no attention to Harriet and poor old Goethe. I was not listening properly, in this case deliberately. <laughs> Almost all accompanists begin their studies more or less heedless of the fact that the needs of the person on the platform with them are paramount and far more important than flashy piano playing. And one of our most important responsibilities is to ensure that the text is audible and comes across clearly. Goethe is one of thousands of poets, ranging from Auden to Baudelaire, from Eichendorf to Pushkin, whose names appear at the top of the song side by side with the composers. This acknowledges that each musical work has two parents, the poet and the composer, and that the poet's words have always existed first. Words are never fitted into existing music. Rather has the music been composed as a reaction to the poem, an amplification, and in the greatest cases, a transfiguration of the words. The combination of words and music like gin and vermouth in a martini potentiates a more potent mixture than either of the constituent parts. Words make us think a thought. Music makes us feel a feeling. But a song makes us feel a thought. It is this realization that has transformed many an aspiring accompanist into a student of poetry. Let us return to the song I've just massacred. Goethe wrote the poem Der Musensohn somewhat autobiographically about being the son of the muses, sauntering through the fields and providing gentle inspiration and uplift as he goes, changing lives and even enticing stiff and clumsy girls and boys to move in time to his music. I didn't speak German when I started, but I, as I daily grappled with poetry in this language, there was no choice but to set my cap at it. Ziemlich geschwind, 
writes Schubert at the top of the music, a warning which means somewhat fast, not very fast. Durch Feld und Wald zu schweifen, writes Goethe, and the verb schweifen, to roam and wander, does not suggest someone on a smash and grab raid. <laughs> However temptingly toe-tapping such a rollicking scherzo might be, over the years one begins to perceive and value a certain moderation and sanity in Schubert's musical responses, an essential reasonableness of tempo, whereby the words can be sung and heard clearly. There were times when the ever active Goethe longed for a holiday, a moment of rest for himself. Ihr lieben Holden Musen, he writes at the end of his poem, a sudden confession of unexpected vulnerability. You dear gracious muses, when shall I return home and find peace again? Performers often ignore Schubert's detailed response to this change of mood, but it's very special. He does something he almost never does, as you can see on your printed music examples, he writes a dynamic marking specifically in the vocal line, in this case, a P for piano, halfway through the poem's last verse. The singer is thus cautioned to sing softly and the pianist is told to play pianissimo. After all this exuberance, there must be a sudden change of color and meaning as the son of the muses, a perennial entertainer, seeks a moment of understanding for his own needs. Here is the song's last page played as we almost always hear it with the special marking ignored. And now, here is the same passage while we attempt to do what the composer and poet actually asked for, a color that allows the vulnerable plea at the end, far from home, dear gracious muses, when shall I at last rest again? <laughs> must be left with the feeling that everything is not fine and dandy, that there is a question mark somehow at the end of that song. In many songs, the stories of the lives of the composers and the poets adds further layers of understanding. Schubert composed Der Musensohn in December 1822, the month he had to face a diagnosis of syphilis, a complete life changer in his own career as a son of the muses. He was to die of other causes before his illness had the chance to wreak havoc. And in the five years remaining to him, he wrote masterpiece after masterpiece. In 1825, he composed Die Junge Nonna, The Young Nun. The poem by Nicholas Krieger, no great literary talent, is melodramatic and the text has tempted thousands of performers into a mood of Gothic drama. 
The raging storm roars through the treetop, sings the nun. The thunder rolls, the lightning flashes, and the night is as dark as the grave. Wie brauchst du die Wipfel der heulende Sturm? Es klirren die Balken, es zittert das Haus. Es rollt die Tonne, es leuchtet der Blitz. that we've just given suggests a formidably feisty young nun in mid-metaphysical crisis, confronting and defying the elements, and the song is performed countless times in this operatic way. There's a problem, however. Schubert clearly stipulates that the opening should be played and sung very quietly, pianissimo. The young nun hears the noises of the storm through the thickness of cloister walls. If we study the poem closely, we realize that she is dying and terrified, perhaps in bed or on her knees in prayer. She hardly has the energy to sing in a dramatic manner. Here is how the opening of the song might sound if we forget about wowing the audience with loud singing and dramatic playing, and if we respect what the composer has asked for a different kind of drama, a great lead, as opposed to an operatic aria. <laughs> which resounds in the accompaniment as the pianist crosses hands. This is the passing bell, the death knell, something very Austrian and very Catholic. The young nun knows that the bell she hears in the distance is indeed tolling for her. At first she is terrified by death and the grave, but it is the sound of this bell inviting her to the eternal heights that enables her to refocus on her faith. Having overcome her fear, she dies singing a final alleluia.
The fact that the bell is heard an octave lower right at the end is a sign that life has finally drained from our protagonist. She has an enormous struggle, but it's not out on the heath waving her fist. It's indeed a deeper experience, both for the listener and the performer. A performance of Die Junge Nonna must go from life to death, from storm to peacefulness in a single trajectory, without the help of stage movement or scenery or lighting. The Opera House at Covent Garden, on the other hand, and every other opera house in the world has any number of set and costume designers, lighting engineers and producers, and an orchestra and chorus, plus numerous famous conductors. Those of us working in song have to play all those roles with no budget at all. Singer and pianist have to conjure worlds of expression and feeling without any outside help. The singer has no microphone and the piano is one of the few complicated pieces of machinery that has no need of electricity. The song world is about economy and devastating expressiveness within contained parameters. Conductors of orchestras regularly hire singers but seldom ask their opinions regarding interpretation and tempo. Singers are expected to submit almost unquestionably to the baton of the maestro. In contrast, the relationship between singer and pianist is a real collaboration. Nevertheless, it is the accompanist who is almost always required to initiate many of the choices otherwise left to a conductor regarding tempo and mood, executing them what's more with his own fingers. Conductors simply wave their hands and the orchestral players produce a wonderful wall of sound. For all conductors, all music is in the simple key of C major because they don't actually have to play anything themselves. As you've seen, it's not enough for a company simply to play the notes. How to play them is a knife edge challenge. Most songs give us only a very short time at the beginning to set the scene. The right mood has to be created at the keyboard. Then and there, we have to play text to rise above the notes in order to incorporate the meaning of the poetry. Every time I accompany a singer, I'm silently singing with them, going through the words in my head as I play. If I am distracted from this intense concentrated support, silent though it is, I'm amazed how often those singers will get the words wrong or have a memory lapse. This little trick also produces the best possible ensemble, as well as ensuring that my mind and fingers are constantly engaged with and responsive to each detail of the sung text. It is an invisible bond between singers and their accompanists that they are both experiencing the same textual thoughts and images at the same time. Despite this telepathy between singer and pianist, personal chemistry plays less of a part than an acuteness of ear. I once coached a Russian duo, a soprano usually accompanied by her husband. They imagined themselves as twin souls in the making of beautiful music. Unfortunately, their ensemble was terrible because despite their mutual devotion, they didn't really listen to each other. When I took over from the husband at the piano stool, there was an instantaneous improvement in the wife's singing. It's amazingly how different a voice can sound when supported by an experienced accompanist. The Russian husband became very agitated. How, he said, can you do this for her when you do not know her as I do, flesh and body, or do you? I had to explain quickly and nervously that a song duo is about a shared love and respect for the music. It's not about physical unity. Professional skills are required more than profound friendship. And experience as an accompanist is at least as important as wonderful piano playing. For most of the 20th century, solo pianists considered it a career disaster to play any kind of accompaniment. Those were the days of Gerald Moore. These days, it is seen as a demonstration of their cultured versatility. Perhaps an emancipatory step 
forward for our formerly scorned profession. But the brilliant execution of introductions and postludes does not automatically add up to good accompaniment. If that were the case, every solo pianist could turn into a wonderful accompanist in the twinkling of an eye. Of course, celebrity collaborations between singers and famous solo pianists make for good box office. Occasionally, these celebrities take accompaniment seriously as a separate discipline, but these partnerships often turn out to be curiously unsatisfactory. Voice and piano moving along on parallel tracks rather than functioning as a duo with voice and piano helping each other in symbiotic manner. Accompanying as an art, as a life's work, as a skill taking years to acquire is still thought of, not by everyone, thank heavens, as a watered down version of solo pianism, a breezy night off, child's play. It is in fact a very adult occupation and that is why there is a complete absence of wunderkind accompanists in the profession. While teenage solo pianists alone on the platform and no danger to anyone but themselves can hold a concert hall in their thrall. The accompanist can also be spellbinding, but it is work for someone older and wiser. Taking care of another person on the platform, not just oneself, requires a certain kind of maturity. We take a long time to learn how to nurture our partners bar by bar, phrase by phrase, and thought by thought. Surely it's not too much to acknowledge that we accompanists do a special job and that we are specialists. Imagine a famous divorce lawyer taking over a murder case. Great fun for everyone except the defendant. Imagine a famous brain surgeon turning up at an operating theater and just for the hell of it having a go at plastic surgery. <laughs> Actually, plastic surgery is not a bad metaphor for one aspect of the accompanist job. The art of covering up the singer's blemishes and disguising their performance wrinkles as if they had never existed. On countless occasions, the ever-attentive pianist has saved the day in a recital by jumping to strange places in the score where the singer's memory has led them in error. <laughs> a quick on-the-spot cut and snip on the accompanist part has prevented total breakdown and humiliation for the soloist in more cases than I can remember. And it is all done in such a way that the audience scarcely notices that there's been anything amiss. Whereas only a handful of song composers have been singers, Almost all the great song composers have themselves been accompanists of their own music. Brahms, Wolf, Strauss, Faure, Debussy, Poulenc, Britten, they all wrote their piano accompaniments for themselves. Schubert never performed his piano sonatas, but he jealously reserved the right to accompany his own songs. And of course, in accompanying Schubert, as well as his own songs, Benjamin Britten was also incomparable. We will now hear a folk song arrangement famously associated with Britten. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Sally Gardens, a poem by W.B. Yeats, had been attached to a beautiful melody by the Northern Irish composer Herbert Hughes, who also provided a piano accompaniment. Here is part of the Hughes arrangement. is pleasant enough, but the sorrow and regret in the text are conveyed by the melody alone, with the piano taking an anodyne role in the proceedings. 
Here is the introduction for the Sally Gardens, composed by Benjamin Britten, music that uncannily captures the pangs of regretful nostalgia in the Yeats poem. The poet's memories of a failed love affair in his youth are replayed in the mists of memory, and the accompaniment is vital in establishing the mood of the song. Harriet will now sing the song's second verse in Britain's arrangement with a simple yet devastating change on the word foolish. Britain colors the harmony to suggest tender regret for a misunderstanding long ago and a dream that might have been. is a song that relies on its accompaniment for the full measure of its expressiveness. One example amongst thousands and thousands. Recordings made it possible for me to hear what Britain himself did in accompanying that song, and it would be not too much to say that those in my profession are song composers, plenipotentiaries, and stand-ins when we play their accompaniments. And what a privilege that is. At the piano, three words that used to be a slick and demeaning label for our role. At the piano, we are immersed in great music combined with the challenge of bringing it to life together with our colleagues. For me, that remains the most important reason for doing this job, and it is surely the most important reason why hundreds of young people at music colleges throughout the world are still choosing this profession. There may have been a decline in audience members for going to leader and song recitals, but there are no fewer young people, both singers and pianists, willing to devote their lives to this discipline. Sadly, it's necessary to warn those on the threshold of making such a choice that there are also drawbacks and inequalities. Idealistic student singers, for example, together with their pianists, tend to split their fees 50-50. But as soon as agents and larger arts organizations get involved, this changes dramatically. When accompanying a famous singer, accompanists regard themselves very lucky to earn between a half and a third, sometimes even less, of the amount the singer receives. But money is not the only issue. What about appreciation? we are so often totally ignored or damned with faint praise. In the green room after a concert, compliments, if they are given at all, often follow a polite formula. You played most sensitively or beautifully. This usually means thank you for being an invisibly benign presence. <laughs> I remember a lavish post-concert reception where the well-to-do sponsor's wife, just before leaving, turned in my direction, having hitherto ignored me, and well done you, she said. 
She then turned to the young man who'd been serving the wine, and well done, you too. <laughs> Thinking of that incident when my playing was valued equally with that of a wine waiter, I longed to travel back in time to confront my erstwhile hostess with a quote from a Shakespeare sonnet. Shall you compare me to a sommelier? <laughs> I used to imagine that such condescension in the green room must, have, must be somehow deserved. Indeed, I did not rule out that it is sometimes merited, but as all my colleagues have very often experienced exactly the same treatment, there has to be a better explanation. I came to realize that many of those who seemed too lofty to comment on our playing had simply not taken it in, I mean really heard it. After all, many people visiting the National Gallery walk quickly past any number of marvelous pictures, not because they wish to belittle the painter, but because they simply don't have the eyes to see that kind of beauty. A musician usually has to work hard to develop his eye, but he assiduously develops his ear from early on. Listening to music in parts requires oral exercise. Many people who attend concerts of vocal music have no such training. They are only interested in, only able to hear the top line, usually a singer. Anything beneath that top line, including the accompaniment, appears to be a fog of indeterminate sound. At an opera, the same people hear the vocal melodies and the quality of the singer's voice, a very sensual experience, admittedly. But the interplay of different instruments within the orchestral texture is lost on them. Thank heavens, there are also many listeners with gifted ears. There are amateurs who hear all sorts of things in the music that are missed or discounted by professionals. And there is such a thing as innate listening talent that does not require further training. The accompanist's hard work tend to go unnoticed by lazy ears and when there is an absence of concentration and curiosity on the part of the listener. You may also think that such self-pitying observations are irrelevant or just plain cheeky. After all, there are plenty of overlooked people in the service industries who are far more essential to society than any accompanist or indeed any musician. Why should a wine waiter's work be less important than mine? There are countless workers and teachers and nurses and carers who are undervalued, underpaid and taken for granted. These are wonderful people who are motivated by a sense of serving and duty and who get precious little gratitude for the unstinting devotion to their work and what they say in private about the unfairness of it all is seldom recorded. We accompanists sit next to our singers at the top table in the musical sense, so what do we have to complain about? Well, the simple fact is that in the eyes of many, we don't really belong there. We spend our lives near enough to fame to imagine and hope that its proximity may rub off on us. Fame seems to be just around the corner, but as for that mythological character Tantalus, the fruits of our desires, real recognition perhaps, remain just out of reach. At first, this accompanying life seems very exciting, a dizzying experience for a youngster who appears to be lifted by those with whom or he or she works to a level of celebrity equal to theirs. They travel the world with their singers. They stay at the same hotels. Most promoters are kind enough to treat them with consideration and civility as long as they are part of the A team. The quality of the musical work leads them to suppose that they are members of musical royalty. But in truth, they are allowed in the front row simply because they are part of the Queen of Songs retinue. They are an equerry or lady of the bedchamber, or more bluntly, a roadie or a baggage character. Being a facilitator for singers with a large dose of bonhomie may feel great at the time, but is it really enough? We all thought it would be better than this. When a senior accompanist complained to me in his old age that he felt tossed aside and forgotten by his erstwhile singers, I asked him whether he'd bothered to remain faithfully in touch with the doctor, now retired, who had seen him through a number of illnesses, or the dentist who had filled his teeth for 20 years, 
Of course, his answer was a rather rueful no. My retired colleague had somehow imagined, understandably perhaps, that the bonds between people who had shared a life in music might have been, should have been, different and somehow eternal. The only thing that is eternal is the music itself, and it is the only point in doing this work. The music will never disappoint you, and great composers cannot let you down. They are our armor against being taken for granted, and in serving them, we find a purpose and dignity that is impervious to belittlement. As a teacher, I encourage most of all those youngsters into this profession who have a naturally altruistic side to their natures, those who will clearly take pleasure in nurture for its own sake, those for whom a life of service to composer and singer will be rewarded enough. And for those ambitious and driven souls, Pianists who see this work as a nifty pathway or fast track to the big time, I can only hope that they leave our ranks as quickly as possible and become conductors, music directors in the West End, or other better paid jobs in the profession. Even I sometimes fantasize about how different my life might have been with a glittering conducting career. I might have just pulled it off with Johnson as a surname but probably only if my first name had been Russian, something like Boris, perhaps. <laughs> Even then, I might have been criticized for my lack of interpretative depth and my inability to get the orchestra to play together. <laughs> to close this evening's lecture, I want to return to one of the songs that I played that played a significant part in my decision to become an accompanist. 45 years ago, a singer at the Royal Academy of Music asked me to sight-read a song by Hugo Wolf. I knew none of this composer's music. It's not a name that one hears in the orchestral or chamber music world. Five minutes later, after playing through that song, I knew Hugo Wolf was someone whose music would always be part of my life. The accompaniment of the song, Auch Kleine Dinger, was built from a group of four perfectly balanced notes that fitted under the hand as if in playing the music I were holding something small and infinitely precious. All in the span of a child's hand. It was a song of such perfection and economy that it was impossible to imagine a note being different. There was an English translation printed under the German. Even small things can delight us, even small things can be precious. The olive is small, yet prized for its goodness. Think how small the rose is, and yet it smells so lovely. I read this only after having played the song first, but I'd already guessed what the poem was about just from the music itself. Hugo Wolf had made a miraculous act of translation by adding musical feeling to a little Tuscan poem about smallness. He achieved a transfiguration and he enabled us to feel that thought. The text warns us not to underestimate things that are small and that includes not only the song but also the song form in general. Like some medieval sorcerer's apprentice, I was amazed to see the workings of an alchemy whereby Wolf united word and tone, turning them into an amalgam of purest musical gold. Throughout this lecture, ladies and gentlemen, I've spoken only for myself, and I'm aware that many of my colleagues will feel entirely differently. Like singers, each accompanist has an individual voice and sound at the keyboard. Unsurprisingly, there are layers of specialisms within this specialist career. I've survived by finding solutions that fit my own personality. And again, speaking for myself, I remain an apprentice who has served many masters, while not considering my masters to have been those who have kindly employed me to go on stage with them. I owe my deepest fealty to the composers and poets whose work has brought me indescribable joy. Certainly, I walk behind singers. When I come onto the platform, I observe the various niceties and conventions of my role, but my real place has always been side by side with very special singers, like Harriet, as an equal, 
I have been lucky enough to have been treated as such by those colleagues who understand what piano accompanied song truly is. We will now perform Wolf's song, Our Kleine Dinger, Even Small Things Can Bring Us Pleasure. Our task is to take the magical message off the page and make it audible to you, the audience, the outside world, in a way that is worthy of the composer's inspiration. And this is something that takes a lifetime to get right. Oh, <laughs> 